Well, uh, I don't have a cape, but I do have an accordion. Uh, so before I get into uh, the, the main part of my talk, which is continuing on this theme of the digital and physical overlap, uh, would you like to hear a little accordion music? It's always a risky question to put out there. Um, I'll, I'll just play a little something. I, you know, I was a musician long before I started a company. And um, I think, you know, like Mark and Michael were saying, it's really important to have something that motivates you and something that influences the rest of your business. Uh, so I'll just uh, play a little something here, and then we'll get to it. Wow, you guys are a great audience. Uh, don't always get that. I appreciate that. Um, so uh, I'm here to talk to you um, about how what happens in our venues can get translated to the digital realm. Before the internet came along, shows were only available within the four walls of a venue, just like this. If you wanted to see a show, you had to go to the venue and sit down and be a part of the experience. And if you couldn't make it to the venue for whatever reason, you simply couldn't experience the show in real time. Maybe you could see pictures or videos after the fact, but that was as close as you could get. Now, those four walls are coming down. And it's due to the internet and cell phones and the constant connectivity that allows us to connect and share instantaneously with the rest of the world from wherever we are. More specifically, that means that patrons in your venues can share images, audio, and video in real time, and there's no stopping it. Now, this doesn't have to be a negative thing. Instead, we can leverage that content to build our brand online as well as in person. It's a new landscape, and as a musician and an entrepreneur, I'm hoping to tell you a little bit about what I've experienced from the front lines of dealing with this stuff myself. Uh, I started my company, Concert Window, a little over three years ago with a classmate of mine named Forrest O'Connor. Uh, we had a band together in college, and uh, he's, he's a fantastic mandolin player. Uh, so after we graduated, we got talking and we had this idea. Wouldn't it be cool if you could experience a show even if you weren't at the venue? Now, Really what that means is live streaming video. And at the time, this was you know, over three years ago, there really wasn't anybody doing this at the time. Um, and so we decided to go for it ourselves. And uh, I'd, I'd just come off a year living in Ireland, uh, playing my accordion for a living, which was awesome. Um, but we decided to move back to Boston and start this company. So I taught myself how to code and uh, built a rudimentary site with WordPress. Uh, where we could carry the, li the live video, and I used a plugin to enable us to sell tickets on the site. So we approached a local venue called Club Passim, uh, where Bob Dylan and Joan Baez had played, and where Forrest and I had performed when we were in college. So we convinced the owners to let us put in a video camera in the front of the house, kind of like, it's, it's a much smaller room than this, but basically there was a camera right on the wall, uh, we had a computer in the back connected to the camera, and we took a direct audio feed from the soundboard into the computer. And using this setup, we were able to upload a live stream, uh, video and audio, uh, up to the website, which I had built. And uh, like I said, it was very rudimentary, and it's a good thing that uh, I don't have any screenshots of it, because I'd love to never see that again as well. Um, but it worked. And so we got this set up going, and uh, we 
had a local band named Della May who did our first ever show. Uh, and they, they played in the venue and we streamed the video. And 40 people tuned in from as far as Alaska and South America and Europe. And uh, as they were watching the video, they could chat in a chat room right next to the image. And so, you know, it wasn't the same as being in the venue, but there was some magic there. Uh, everything was in real time. And so it was very different from watching a YouTube video. You knew that anything happening in the venue, you would be seeing at the same time as anybody in the venue was seeing it. And as a result, with the chat room and, and the real time element, there was a kind of shared experience that was created. So we kept doing webcasts, and ticket sales were, were decent. Uh, we sold 10 to 20 tickets a show at $5 a ticket. A third of the money went to the musician, a third to the venue, and a third to us. Now, everything was handled remotely. We built this video setup so that we would start and stop the webcasts. The artists wouldn't have to do anything. The venues wouldn't have to do anything. And this seemed like a great idea, but what ended up happening was that the venues and musicians didn't really have to do anything special in order for the webcast to happen. And neither of them were intimately connected in the actual broadcast itself um, in terms of facilitating the broadcast. And as a result, not everybody was heavily invested in the project. So we kept going and we expanded to 12 venues around the country. Revenues weren't covering costs and you know, Annie's macaroni and cheese with green peas was getting pretty old. <laughs> Um, and we were, we were about to run out of money, and we were literally one day from shutting the entire business down uh, when we had a new last-ditch idea. And that is, what if instead of requiring all this equipment and signing deals with these venues, what if we could go straight to the musician, and what if they could play a show using equipment that they already had, their laptops? So, we thought, what if you could open up a laptop in your living room uh, on a night off and play a show into it and people around the world could tune in and chat? Um, maybe, maybe you could even make some money that way. So the next step was if musicians could do this and they could use their own equipment to set up a stream, why couldn't organizations? Why couldn't venues? We realized this was a new way to think about live streaming. Now, it was an independent, self-motivated platform that anyone from a musician to a venue could use to stream and monetize their live content. We realized that Concert Window is really a tool. So we built a proof of concept, and uh, we had a better website at this point, and uh, we uh, made the ticketing pay what you want. Uh, so you could pay whatever you wanted from a dollar minimum up to, you know, 500 bucks. Um, we also had a tip function so that when you're watching the video, you could very easily tip, just like a tip jar or when you see a busker in Central Park, you can throw a few dollars into the hat. Um, and the final thing was the chat. And the difference between this chat and the old chat was that as people typed in comments, the performer could see the comments coming in while they were playing, which creates a very different dynamic. Uh, so I convinced my co-founder, Forrest, to do the first show. He's a great mandolin player. Um, but he's, you know, he's by no means uh, a well-known musician. He, he plays open mics and, and plays around town. Uh, so he sat in his living room for a half hour, and he put out the word on Facebook and Twitter, and his friends and family tuned in. And at the end of a half hour, he had made $140. And for somebody who often plays for free at an open mic for a couple hours, uh, this was a, an important sum of money. And so we, we knew we were onto something. So we kept scheduling more shows, and I guilt tripped my friends into signing up for, uh, for their own shows. And pretty soon, people were making $500, $800, and more in their living rooms sitting down for a half hour. Uh, since then, we've had Grammy winners do shows. Uh, we've had American Idol contestants do shows right alongside an 80-year-old fiddle player named Fiddle Bob, uh, <laughs> who's just been playing for a couple years. And as a musician, what I really like about that is that everybody is on an equal playing field. Uh, some, some trends are starting to appear. 
As soon as we switched from set $5 tickets to pay what you want tickets, uh, two things immediately happened. One is that we doubled the number of tickets sold, which is probably not all that surprising because it's more flexible, but, but we doubled tickets sold. The second thing is that the average price paid for tickets also doubled. And what caused that is it's a very different question. Before we were saying, if you want to experience this content, it's gonna cost you five bucks. Now we were saying, it's your choice what to pay. How much do you value the music and how much do you wanna support the musician? And that's a very different question. What we're seeing is the emergence of a direct relationship between content creators and their fans. There are no gatekeepers anymore. There's no one telling you what to play or when to play or anything like that. It's totally up to you. And this, as it happens, is what the internet is really good at. Cheap and free services like Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and email all allow you to create that direct, real-time bond with your fans. And as that emotional bond grows, and the fans feel like they know what's going on behind the scenes, and even seeing what you ate for breakfast, Everything like that builds that emotional connection, and when people are given the opportunity to support you financially, they will, often at staggering rates. What works in the physical world doesn't necessarily work online. Rather than writing the coattails of a physical experience and just offering a representation of it online, it's better to build a brand new digital native experience that can only happen in the digital realm. So it's time to build some new experiences. What if you could hang out with a performer and request songs and have them played back? Or what if you could watch a rehearsal online and then attend the show in person later that week? Or how about an interactive video chat with the show's director